Thank you. Um, it's actually interesting that, maybe because I wrote my own introduction, that I, I'm the only person who's spoken today who's, refer, who's been referred to as a futurist, right? But you've heard a lot of futures thinking from every presenter today. Vanessa started out talking about a possible future. Dino, who's no longer sitting there, there he is, he moved, <laughs> was talking about a possible future. Certainly you heard uh, Ken talk about a possible future. Um, so interestingly enough, we've gotten to a point now in the agenda where I'm sitting there with my notes that I put together yesterday or the day before, and I'm like crossing things off. I'm like there is absolutely nothing left to talk about in my session. Um, are people familiar with what a futurist is and what a futurist does? Wavy hand. Uh-oh. That's not a, Now you've met two. Um, so, there are many Al Gore, Al Gore right? Right. So, all right. Futurists. First of all, futurists do not predict the future. Right. We do not predict the future. Um, do you know what you call people who predict the future? Crackpots. Did anybody say crackpots? <laughs> so, really, what we do is we help businesses understand changes that may be coming and think about how those changes might impact the businesses they're in, right? And typically the way we do that is not necessarily by thinking so much about what's coming, what's coming in the future, but really thinking about what's happening now and looking at hard trends. Trending topics are not a trend. You know, what's going to be hot on the runway in the fall is not a trend, right? We're talking about hard trend lines, things that have been happening over time. I think somebody earlier made reference to um, the fact that you know, technology has always been about making our lives easier, right? That is absolutely true. We are probably the laziest species on this planet, right? So going back to the fire or the spear tip, that's technology, and that's really been about making our lives easier. I'm not going to go that far back, and I'm not going to talk about the Gutenberg Press. I crossed that off of my notes. <laughs> Right? But what I, wanna, I do want to go back 10 years, 2003, right? So a decade ago, there were 500 million devices connected to the internet 10 years ago. 500 million devices. That may be, does that sound like a lot, a little? A little, right? That's less than one device for every 10 people. That's roughly one device for every one person in this room who's been able to get onto the Wi-Fi network today, right? <laughs> Sometime around 2008, 2009, though, the number of devices connected to the internet began to exceed the number of human beings in the world, right? Not just connected to the internet, in the world. This year, Cisco uh, is projecting that there will be more mobile devices on the internet than there are people in the world. If we look out now to 2020, so just a few years down the road, there will, be, there will be 5 billion people connected to the internet, right? That's a lot more than, than we have connected today, and 50 billion devices connected to the internet, right? When you look at that and you kind of multiplex it and you think about, it, obviously the internet is not just about connecting a machine to a machine. It's not just connecting about a, per, you know, a person to a machine. It's about also connecting people to people. That's something like five sextillion possible connections between people and things, right? I'm the only, I'm, I think I'm the first, other, I didn't bring any like sticky things. I'm the only person to bore the audience with numbers, right? <clears throat> now, I did say sex. And, 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 and we know where we can get Viagra now. It's the US government. They've got a stockpile. <laughs> right? So um, clearly, we are becoming more connected. We are becoming hyper connected. We all know that. Um, what's, what'll be interesting as it plays out is, you know, it'll be interesting to see how some of this takes shape, right? How, how some of this shapes up and, and, and what this world of hyper connectivity looks like. We've been talking a lot about devices. We've been talking about the move from the desktop to the laptop, to the mobile phone, to the, to the tablet. We were wowed with you know, these you know, you know, visions of, of you know, this like wondrous future where you're, you're surrounded by screens. We were talking about 
OK Glass, Google Glass, right? Um, and the, so if, you know, it's like, well, which are we going to have? Are we going to be surrounded by screens, or are the screens going to be right here in our face? Uh, the answer is yes, right? We're going to have all of these things at some point in time. Some will fail, some will succeed. This is not an or situation. Right now, for better or for worse, from a technology standpoint, we are in an and situation, right? How many people have just a tablet? Just a smartphone? Just a smartphone. No tablet? No laptop? No desktop? <laughs> Right? You know, we're not throwing away old technologies when we get new technologies. The average home in the US has 20 connected devices. Right? 20 connected devices. Right? So, um, you know, so we're in this state of and where we're just collecting garbage, right? You know, these, these machines that we stick in our pockets and on our desktops, and, and, and it's just proliferating. Um, but, you know, that's kind of not even the interesting part, right? You know, that ultimately it, it really comes down to, and you know, I'm not, I've stopped talking about social media, but it is about people connecting with people, right? Um, you know, so, um, you know, it's, it's like the technology is interesting, right? And we want to understand the technology. It's what we do with the technology that, uh, you know, kind of makes the difference between that's incredible and that's insidious. Um, and I think as, you know, as people, as business people, we have to begin to think about how do we draw the line between the two. And I'm going to talk about some of that in a little bit, but I also want to talk about this, uh, another uh, key concept that um, as I was listening to everybody talk about screens and about Google Glass and about mobile and social and all these things, um, by the time we get to half of, or 500 um, billion, 50 billion, I'm sorry, 50 billion devices, the definition of what is a device fundamentally changes. Um, it, it, it may seem futuristic to think about a refrigerator that's got a smart screen on it um, that not only feeds you recipes but also you know, tells you what kind of food you need to buy. But that's still an object, an electronic, that plugs into the wall and runs off of electricity. What happens over the course of the next decade, the course of the next two, is that the definition of device fundamentally changes. The difference between what is a device and what is not a device, what is digital and what is physical, fundamentally vanishes. So you know, when you think about devices, think about you know, did or digital ubiquity, you've got to think about the environment that you move through. And several people have spoken about smart homes and things like that. But typically when people talk about smart homes, they're talking about things that are still fundamentally technology devices, right? A thermostat that knows when you're in the room and what your preference is about the temperature. They're not talking about smart paint that knows when your ceiling is going to crack. And that's not science fiction. That paint exists today. It's probably not in your house, right? But that paint exists today. They're not talking about smart ground, right? Smart asphalt, smart, um, smart cement, whatever it may be. These things do exist today, right? So the environment you move through becomes a smart environment that isn't reacting to you. You're probably going to react to it. And that might be scary. Um, the second thing is, like, what about, so it's not just the environment you move through, what about the food you eat, right? The stuff you're actually putting in your body. Um, are people aware, I don't know if anybody else saw this story, um, there is a postdoc at Tufts who's created edible smart silk sensors, right, that can tell you whether the food you just ate was past its expiration date. Right? It's, you know, it, it can tell you that the banana should have been banana bread. Right? That, you know, edible smart sensors like that. Um, when you think about wearables, you, pro, you, know, you conjure this vision of you know, the minority port situation. You, know, you think of the, the Google Glass or, or whatever else. Um, are people familiar with the, the Burberry line of custom clothing that's coming in the fall? Right? You know, where it actually comes with chips embedded in the clothing that display personalized content experiences when your jacket interacts with your phone. Right? So the, the idea of a, of a smart wearable or a digital wearable, it's the same old wearable you had and it's made out of cashmere. Right? Um, there's also, of course, the fact that your body will become the mobile device. 
and you know, and, and, you know, we we giggled a little bit when Dino talked about um, about implants, right? You know, an, an implant that scrolls data, um, but that is coming at some point. You know, it's coming at some point, good, bad, or otherwise. We already have implants, right? We have you know implants in the ears so the deaf can hear. There's been an FDA approval for a bionic eye that'll allow the blind to see. There's an Alzheimer's chip implant. Some people have breast implants, not me, right? We already put implants into our bodies. Why not a Wikipedia implant? Why not, right? It might be annoying. It's going to be wrong because Wikipedia is almost always wrong, <laughs> right? But, but you know, somebody somewhere will want that thing. Um, you know, there's also, uh, you know, there's a team of scientists in, uh, in Korea who have already been, manuf they've been manufacturing and testing electronic skin, right? So it's not, you're not going to cover your whole body in electronic skin like Tron, right? But you can have smart sensors on your skin that can monitor your vital signs and, and let you know when you're getting sick, right? Before you know you're getting sick. Right? So you know, all of a sudden now you have a totally different paradigm for how you manage wellness as opposed to treat illness. What's that going to do to the pharmaceuticals you know, uh, industry? Um, you know, there's uh, the IEEE, right? um, the, the same people that came up with the Wi-Fi standard, you know, 802.11b, whatever it is. Right? They have a body Wi-Fi standard that they've already established for the Wi-Fi network that lives in and on your body. That standard exists today. Now people obviously need to start making things that run on that standard, right? So there is a lot of stuff that's coming. Um, and I guess one of the blessings of going late in the day is that I get to talk about the things that are maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years out um, before Andrew comes on and tells us it's going to kill us all, um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> which it probably is, right? Um, you know, but but you know, some of this stuff is coming way down the path. Um, and you know, while you might not be able to do something about electronic skin today, um, and you probably don't need to think specifically about, you know, different form factors for technologies that might not exist for another 5, 10, 15 years, you do need to start to think about how some of these things, even in their earliest, earliest stages, are going to shape the way we do business. And I want to shift gears a little bit. It's a little bit actually surprising to me that, We've gotten this far, and there haven't actually been Shanali, yes, uh, but not a whole lot of conversations about what does any of this really mean for business. We've been talking a lot about what it means for technologists, what it means for developers, what it means for coders, uh, but not a whole lot about what it means for business. Um, so I want to talk about a few principles, and then we can kind of open it up to Q&A. Um, and, and obviously, these are all opinions. Um, and they're probably opinions not everybody will share. So hopefully that'll get people yelling at me. Um, if, uh, if, you're, if you're tweeting about this and there's something you don't like, I'm Jeff Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> so, so first and foremost, if you make a product today, you damn well better figure out how to get into the services business tomorrow. Every product business will be a services business. I'm not saying products are going away. You're not going to have an internet of things if there are no things. People are always going to want to buy stuff. But what you're going to see is that there's going to be an increased focus on how goods can be delivered as services. And this layer of ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous connectivity, makes it possible. Right? So think about a simple example of Zipcar or Car2Go here in the DC market, which I actually didn't know about, but I've known about Zipcar, of course. Right? Zipcar or Car2Go would not work if you weren't able to track locations of the car using GPS, find them using your mobile phone, um, and process payments you know, using the, you know, sort of the, inter, you know, the, the financial underpinnings of you know, e-commerce. Right? These things, of course, exist today. Has anybody, is there anybody from San Francisco? Does anybody come in from here from San Francisco? Um, have you used Drive Now? OK, so the, what was that? Yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm from San Francisco. Um, right, so, so in San Francisco, as well as a number of markets around the globe, actually, you can use a service called Drive Now, which ostensibly looks almost exactly the same as Zipcar, right? You can find the car you want to drive on the street corner where you want to pick it up. 
You can you know, rent it for the, by the minute, by the hour, by the day, by the week, whatever it is. All you have to do at the end of the day is you pay for use and you return it to where, wherever you picked it up. With one fundamental difference, the company that provides the drive now service is BMW, right? Here's a company who makes its money selling physical cars, providing a service in urban centers that allows you to drive their vehicles without ever buying a physical car, right? This is a car as a service made available through a company that is used to selling cars as products. And for the first time, they launched it two years ago, that service is now turning a profit, right? So um, you need to think about no matter what it is you make, um, how is it that you can add a layer of service and redefine the way you deliver your products to your customers? That's the first thing. The second thing um, is we've been talking about a lot of sort of bright, shiny, wondrous future stuff. I'm on the phone in my car, then I'm on the phone on my phone, then I'm on the, I'm on the phone in my fridge, then I'm, I'm blocking it because I'm talking about my kid and my kid's getting really annoyed because I'm saying stuff about him and it's on my fridge, right? Uh, in order for that to work, we are going to have to do some really, really, really tricky stuff, right? And it's not just about how do you make a smart fridge. You actually need to fundamentally rewire the way most large corporations think, right? Because most large corporations build their strategies around sustained competitive advantage. In order to operate in an interconnected world, you need to build your strategy on sustainable collaborative advantage, right? So if we're talking about, for example, um, we're talking about a, you know, if I'm a pharmaceutical company, um, my business is built around IP, right? And this is why pharma companies are hurting right now. Pharma companies have seen their revenue and their profits crumble because all of their blockbuster drugs are coming off patent. And when their drugs come off patent, they're not refilling the R&D pipeline fast enough to bring to market new blockbuster drugs. That entire business is built around IP, right? So it is not today in, I don't know, Pfizer's vested interest to partner with Nike to figure out how to deliver better health outcomes using fuel band in such a way that it might mean the patient doesn't need his or her medication. Right? They're going to have to figure that out. Nike and Pfizer arbitrarily as two potential companies, I'm not saying them specifically, need to figure out how do they work together and not fret about IP. Otherwise, none of this stuff is going to work. Um, and it's the, the same is true even at the technology layer. A refrigerator that's written to a different API than, you know, uh, or on, on a different you know, programming language or on a different standard than a telephone will not be able to talk together seamlessly. It's not going to happen, right? How many people can't get their remote to talk with their television? <laughs> That's still true. How many years have we had televisions that run on remotes? Um, all right, the, the, third, the third, I think, the third concept um, that uh, you know, I kind of want to introduce. I want to start by asking a question about American Express. What business is American Express in? Membership. Membership? Data. Service. Service. What did I hear? What did I hear over? Data. They are a data company, good, bad, or otherwise. That's what they are. Uh, when you see some of the things that, I mean, they of course make products and they provide services, but at the end of the day, their core digital asset is the database. And if you ask Ken Chenault, their, sh their chairman, what business they are in and where, you know, like what is the basis of their competitive advantage in a digital age, he will tell you, we are a data-driven business. Um, you know, and they have what Ken calls a closed digital loop, which he sees, and I don't know how it's a closed loop. I tried to get him to explain it, and it didn't sound closed at all. Uh, but but he, you know, the, he explained a scenario in which, you know, that is really a, it is a somewhat unique competitive advantage that they have a, a, a large um, database of consumers and a large database of merchants. So they not only know what you bought at Walmart, they know what everyone's buying at Walmart. And they can put your purchase within context of this larger um, this larger context. Um, and don't think for a second that they're not leveraging that to not only do deals with Walmart, but to do things like link like love with Facebook and 
uh, their recently announced sync with Twitter, right? That is the bargaining chip they bring to the table, right? We've entered an age of big data, and the bigger the data, the better your chance of competing and collaborating in a digital marketplace. Um, so whether you have an, a database of Amex proportions, or you've got you know, a s relatively small membership database for your nonprofit, or you're a small business that's got you know, some limited database for, from, uh, you know, for like, you know, say people that shop in your, in your local retail store, um, you need to start thinking of that as a core asset of your business. Uh, and, and, and that, I think, for, for many companies is going to fundamentally change the way they do business with each other and the way they think about customers, right? And we all know, of course, you know, we, we talk about, you know, the, 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 um, the, you know, sort of the pros and cons of the cloud algorithm versus the tracker algorithm and what does Facebook know versus what not know. All of us in this room are smart enough to understand if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, right? You are the product, right? No matter how much money you spend marketing on Facebook, chances are pretty good you're a lot more valuable to Facebook as a consumer, pumping all your stuff through Facebook so they can learn more and more and more and more about how you behave. Um, and that kind of brings us to, I think, maybe a last point, which is that um, every business is going to have a choice to make. Um, you know, so I'm probably the second most dystopian speaker of the day. Um, and, and you know, I tend to be a bit of a realist. Like, I think the technology is cool, but I don't, th I don't necessarily believe that it's all going to be great, right? It's not all sunshine and roses. Uh, so, um, you know, every business has to make some key decisions. And it's not going to be, you know, clout versus tracker. And it's not going to be Facebook versus Google Plus. I mean, those are essentially, in the grand scheme of things, inconsequential decisions. Right? We shouldn't even be debating those things, sorry. But at the end of the day, every business has to make these like, really like, gut-wrenching fundamental decisions between things like, are you going to pursue profit? Or are you going to pursue purpose? Are you going to you know, respect privacy? Are you going to trounce all over it? I mean, how many people remember the story, not too long ago, an incident with, with Target? Uh, a teenage girl shopped at Target, and Target outed her with advertising to her dad and let her dad know she was pregnant, um, right? That kind of stuff is going to become more and more common. Um, and I think when Jane, I think, said it, you know, earlier during one of the previous Q&As, you know, we're, you know, when, when you get below the age of, I mean, it's probably even younger than Gen Y, right? You know, my kid, my daughter, nine years old, I don't think she will ever fully understand privacy the way we understand privacy until for better or for worse, it comes back to bite her, right? And you know, so we need to think about you know, how are we going to actually leverage these technologies in a way that's a bit more what you should do than what you could do, right?